Good to be back with you once more. And I'm Dr. A. Padmanabhan, and this is We Are on a Journey. Our topic is Hobson's Choice, Modern Medicine versus Integrated Medicine. And uh, today we will be putting the video number four, which is Evidence-Based Medicine and Alternate Medicine. Now, in the previous videos, first three videos, we looked at what is scan that is complementary and alternate medicine, the WHO stand and strategy regarding this, regulatory aspects of CAM and integrative medicine, where we found the regulation was rather flimsy, the safety of CAM we have discussed. Now, in the last video, video number three, we discuss in detail how evidence-based medicine is the basic tenet of conventional medicine. Now, it is something which conventional medicine doctors are unlikely to compromise with. It was not there at the beginning of modern medicine, and we also discussed how it came into being. In today's video, video number four, what we will look is, what is the evidence for alternate medicine, and how does alternate medicine view EBM? This is very important. What do you mean by alternate medicine practitioners? Not only how does their groups look at it. How does the WHO look at EBM for alternate medicine? The, what the NICE guidelines say for uh, the evidence for um, alt, I mean, EBM and alternate medicine, etc. We will be looking into it. And the most important, is there any real evidence for the practice of alternate medicine? Now, I am Dr. A. Padmanabhan and I blog on my other educational videos can be found in this particular YouTube channel where you will find the previous my previous three videos on this topic also. And I also blog on wordprocess.com in the following uh, link. Now let's see some, how some of the intellectuals in alternate medicine is, uh, have to say about alternate medicine uh, cannot be evidence-based. is a written article in Academic Medicine in 2001, but it is applies even now. That's one of the first best counter I have read all through. Now, the insistence can adopt epistemic framework. Epistemic means degree of validity framework of EBM. Implies that the tools and methods of EBM are sufficient for generating medical knowledge regardless of the underlying theory of medicine, the metaphysis of medicine. The metaphysis means fundamental nature of fundamental nature of medicine. Therefore, they say that EBM cannot always uh, uh, generate cannot generate knowledge regardless of the underlying theory of disease, the underlying nature of philosophy. The position is not philo philosophically tenable. Why do they say so? They are recognizable but non-measurable and non-quantifiable differences in ways disease manifests in individuals that are, deter that are important for determining accurate diagnosis, prognosis, or treatment. One of the first counter is that in alternate medicine, there are non-measurable, non-quantifiable differences which you cannot evaluate by EBM. For example, feeling better um, uh, on the whole, uh, uh, feeling happy with life, etc. These are important in alternate medicine. I would uh, list the counters which they come about and then later comment at the end of the uh, of that uh, session. Now regarding EBM and CAM, the knowledge that medicine can come only from clinical trials, but also from clinical observation. This is what they say that clinical observation also knowledge in medicine can come, not by only clinical trials. In traditional understanding of clinical medicine, a medical intervention need be effective in one individual in order to be considered as effective. Therefore, they say even if it is effective in one individual, traditional medicine considered this as effective. To label an interventional study ineffective, then that is to say that it will not benefit any individual patient, or at least not in any individual with a particular disorder. They go on to say, unfortunately, EBM lacks the ability to determine that any particular intervention is ineffective. Randomized control trials that fail to demonstrate efficacy of an intervention across a population do not tell us that the intervention was never effective in a particular individual. It only says uh, only a group. It may not be effective in majority of the patient, 95% or 97%. 
Now they go on to say even the lack of apparent subgroup where the benefit is demonstrated still does not rule out the possibility of causal effectiveness of intervention in particular individuals. That is ineffectiveness at best can be claimed only for the use of a particular intervention in a particular dose or format on a particular schedule by a particular group of practitioners in a particular population. A seemingly infinite number of studies would be required to demonstrate true ineffectiveness of any particular intervention. Because what they generally state is they cannot individualize the findings. Now, what they are concerned about is that I am treating a patient. Your studies have not shown that it is not in effective in that particular patient. And how does that patient, uh, uh, how do you, when you take a group, how do you know whether that patient is included in this? Now, this is where the problem arises. The author doesn't seem to know the fundamentals of design of uh, uh, randomized trials. First, a population of interest, a sample is selected. And this sample is supposed to have, they look very carefully, the statistician carefully looks at the external validity. The external validity means, the external validity refers to the ability to generalize your study finding, the population at large. In other words, are, you, are your findings from a sample applied to all patients? Therefore, external validity is made sure by the designers of the study. And one of the strengths of randomized design are that they have substantially a higher internal and external validity. Therefore, to poo-poo the by EBM and the science of statistics and uh, science of questioning, um, I mean, rational medicine, I don't think applies in the 21st century. They go on to say that CAM and CAM practitioners therefore can continue to emphasize individual outcomes without inconsistency, even when the therapies they utilize have failed to demonstrate efficacy in their clinical control trial. I think this is absolutely nonsense because the basic question is if control trial shows that 95 to 99 percent chance of the intervention is not going to be effective as per p-values, how does the CAM therapist know it is effective in a particular individual? We would like to know from them, how are they sure that it is going to? Now, if they want to give the, give the treatment to a particular patient, a practice in the 21st century ethics demand that they should tell the patient that randomized trials have shown that that particular treatment was not effective in 95 to 99 percent of the patients who were given the treatment. I don't know whether anybody will select such a treatment for himself. If you hide this from the patient and uh, inflict it on the uh, patient without telling him the full repercussions, I don't think it is an ethical medicine to be practiced in the 21st century. One thing we already mentioned is that anecdotes or single observations are enough in uh, alternate medicine. For example, anecdotes about alternate remedies usually published in books and magazines for the public are considered sufficient in themselves as support for therapeutic claims. Now, it might be argued that conventional medicine relies on anecdotes too, some of which are published as case reports in peer-reviewed journals. There are case reports of single case reports, but the difference is they describe a well-documented new finding in a defined setting. And the most important is the case report is not to announce a remedy, but only to suggest an hypothesis that should be tested in a proper clinical trial. That's the seed for in nobody changes the management by a single case report. They put it on trial, they discuss among themselves, and then only they, it is accepted only if clinical trials or, or uh, general of the opinion support this. A single observation is never taken as a reason to change the practice or to practice a new remedy. Now, single observation may be due to placebo effect or bias. What do these protagonists of CAM have to say about it? They say many in CAM require only the patient to feel better, while the EBM appears to require that any feel better in a certain way as a result of an intervention that has been shown to be effective in a clinical trial. Their question is, if somebody, if the patient is happy, 
and he feels better. Why are you concerned whether it is due to placebo or due to uh, by the effect of the medicine? Why do you want to show the effect by the clinical trial? If the patient is happy, that's the end of the matter. But the fact is the placebo maximum. In placebo effect is because the patient has an expectation to benefit. Now the placebo maximum must, may serve as a feel good factor. It will not decrease mortality or morbidity and can delay treatment of specific diseases. Further in this modern world, to give a patient that some drug, some medicine, when we have, and to make him, when he feels better to tell it is because of that and not to reveal to him that the drug had no effect or the drug was not the real reason for his betterment, I don't think is ethical by any, anybody will accept that sort of practice. Now the, regarding bias, while placebo, they don't see reason to do clinical trials. In bias, they take a different view. The problem of bias and proof of efficacy that are raised by orthodox practitioners regarding CAM are real and must be addressed. They say the bias must be addressed. But if they want to address bias without clinical trial, how are they going to address the issue of bias? And how can they accept isolated observations? Summing up, therefore, the call for evidence-based medicine in CAM is problematic, according to many of their protagonists. And one thing which we have not addressed is EBM will remain an incomplete guide to optimal clinical practice for dis disciplines that assert non-measurable but detectable differences between individuals are important to diagnose and treatment of illness. These non-measurable detectable differences are there also in uh, in modern medicine, they don't seem to understand that EBM is not only best research evidence, it also takes into consideration clinical expertise and even patient values. You will find in many international guideline committees, you will find patients are there, asthmatic patients are there in making asthma guidelines. And when evidence measurable the uh, things are not there or evidence from studies are not there. The clinical expertise is often taken when providing guidelines. Now let's find out what is the choice before CAM practitioners regarding EBM. We have come to know what their, what their general opinion is, opinion is. Therefore, these investigations are three ways to relate to their work to EBM. They can accept the EBM hierarchy and carry out RCTs when possible, they can do it when possible. The second is they can accept EBM standards, but argue that special characteristics of alternate medicine warrant acceptance of lower forms of evidence. And three, they can challenge the EBM approach and work to develop new research designs, new standards of evidence that reflect their approach to medical care. Therefore, they can challenge the EBM and have Therefore, this is the attitude which generally most of the practitioners have taken. What WHO itself seems to condone, what even the Ayush seems to say, they challenge the EBM and they work to develop new research designs and new standards of evidence that they that reflect their approach to medical care. Or in other words, they feel that the last, reason, last option is the best preferable for multiple reasons. First, it will meet the needs of alternate day, need alternate medicine practitioners. Moreover, because similar problem beset evaluation of mainstream medical therapies. I don't know how they have come to this conclusion. Mainstream doctors don't have the same issue. Therefore, they want to re-evaluation of standard of evidence will benefit everyone in the medical community, including most com importantly patients. I don't think Anybody in modern medicine or in conventional medicine would reevaluate the standard of evidence. Therefore, this would be a Rubicon line which the modern medicine doctors would never cross. And I don't think how, if the CAM people take this attitude of reevaluation of standards of evidence, you can ever integrate these systems of medicine. In fact, in an editorial, in a homeopathic and Ayurvedic uh, journal, Mr. Panta talks about 
a consolidated standard of reporting, consort approach may be useful to create evidence in Ayurvedic practice. Therefore, they have created their own approach to uh, Ayurvedic practice. Uh, I mean, uh, other than EBM. But, <clears throat> you know, the general attitude of modern medicine doctors is applying for special exemptions from the demands of EBM could be tempting, but it requires that researchers write off the value of scientific endeavor, a decision that is far from ideal. Therefore, there will be no compromise from, from uh, modern medicine doctors in this regard. Therefore, the divide is bound to remain. <clears throat> it's difficult to find evidence. Now onwards, we will look for any evidence in alternate medicine. It's different, difficult to find literature, which definitely talks of evidence in Ayurveda, homeopathy, etc. Therefore, when I found this on the uh, internet, not very clear, evidence base of Ayurveda. You know, this is published by the Central Council of Research of Ayurvedic uh, Medicine, Ministry of Ayush. Therefore, it comes from a very authoritative. And as I was really thrilled when they have written some of the evidences that emerge from double blind randomized, randomized controlled trials and the other efficacy trials. From the Ministry of Health, straight from the horse's head, mouth, they have done double blind randomized controlled trials and they are publishing the results. There are only two or three pages. I don't want to go, I'll just give you a taste of one of them. Here, if you look at it, they have written, uh, I mean, Vacha, I don't want to read it, in ischemic heart disease. They have tried this medicine and placebo, and they are claiming that a significant improvement in symptoms, less like chest pain and respiratory distress, was noted in the treatment group. Mind you, they have given this medicine for patients who had chest pain and respiratory distress, and they have diagnosed it as ischemic heart disease and given this, this medicine. And they're claiming that it was very, very effective. No comments, you can draw your own conclusion. But note one thing, this is a publication of the Ministry of Health, Ayush, under evidence basis of Ayurveda. Another publication I found again from the Central Council of Research and Ayurvedic Sciences, more colorful than the last one, but a little older one, 2014. Evidence-based Ayurvedic practice. That's what they have written, general guidelines. Very good. Now, the patients required special care should be immediately appropriate Ayurvedic or allopathic center service providers. Good, that's a good advice they are given. In case of communicable disease such as malaria and filaria, the first and immediate choice of treatment should be antibiotic and the medicines mentioned in this document may be added on or used with when the antibiotics are not effective. Now, what do they mean by telling that for malaria and filaria, the immediate choice of treatment is antibiotics? First of all, they are not. For those people who are not doctors, we have special malaria drugs and filaria medicine. Diethyl carbamazepine for filaria is not an antibiotic. Leave it alone. But what do they mean by telling that for communicable diseases alone, antibiotics should be used? They are admitting that they have, do not have, they don't have a choice of medicines for communicable diseases. Now for a taste of some more evidence-based advices from this authoritative test book, the they say in case of chronic asthma associated with severe breathlessness, chest congestion and cough, not responding to conservative treatment, they are advised oral medicine for six weeks. Now for the sake of non-medical people, this is an absolute emergency as far as modern medicine is concerned. And many people with severe as with asthma die because they underestimate the severity of the illness. And we do teach them that whenever they have severe breathlessness, which is not responding to in inhalers in the first half an hour or something, they should come running to the hospital for oxygen monitoring, oxygen, and probably treatment in an ICU. Now, they, this authoritative book is advising them 
to take treatment for six weeks at home. I leave it to you for judging the, the dangers associated with it. Now to give another example, in case of essential hypertension associated with headache, fatigue and giddiness, they have advised two medicines to be taken for six weeks. Now, as far as we doctors and modern medicine are concerned, when there's blood pressure with headache, fatigue, giddiness and insomnia, it indicates that you are likely to have an hypertensive encephalopathy. You may have a stroke or you may throw a convulsion and become very serious. Therefore, this is taken very seriously and immediate measures are taken to de decrease your blood pressure. Now, such sort of advice, I think, are not only benefic not beneficial, but very dangerous for the general health of the pa patients. And when it comes from such authoritative sources, the malady it causes is terrible. Now from Ayush, let's go on to WHO and see what the tip, WHO traditional medicine strategy 2014-23 has to talk about evidence. Now they also seem to be quite evasive. They make a statement that knowledge-based policy is the key to integrate traditional and complementary medicine into the national health system. Research should be prioritized and supported in order to generate knowledge. Good and fine, nobody can question that. While there is much to be learned from controlled clinical trials, other evaluation methods are also valuable. In other words, they are telling that EBM need not be the only basis of practice. Therefore, this is where I'm sure conventional medicine doctors would like to oppose WHO even. The importance of embracing various kinds of contributory research methods and designs in the efforts to build a broad evidence base to inform, to inform national policy and decision making has been underlined by the WHO traditional medicine strategy and also by the National Institute of Health and Care, NICE, as well as others. Well, regarding NICE, we will make a few statements subsequently. There are a few slides. I didn't find these words in NICE guidelines anywhere. But whatever it is, WHO seems to indirectly or directly state that you don't have to have follow the first principles of EBM as far as practice of medicine is concerned. Now, how important is this regarding, uh, regarding uh, WHO? If you look at the w difficulties faced by member states, 99 out of the 100 countries reported lack of research data as one of the prime difficulties faced by member states. Therefore, this is a very important matter. Therefore, what does WHO propose to do? Now, it is going to give generalized technical guidelines for research and evaluation of TM and traditional medicine and uh, CAM related to safety, quality and efficacy. They are, they are going to give uh, technical guidance for research to the member countries. Therefore, the member countries will be doing research to generate evidence-based ma management. Plus, please understand that the expenditure of approximately 2.2 billion by the National Center of Complementary and Alternate Medicine is in America from the years 1999 to 2017, 18 years, they have done clinical trials, produce no sound consistent evidence for the efficacy of any alternate therapy. Therefore, this is alternate therapy in medical centers, compromised medical advanced practice. This is in the, clinical, in the Journal of Clinical Investigation, published in 2020. Therefore, for 18 years, spending 2.2 billion in America, they did not find any sound, consistent evidence for the efficacy of any alternate therapies. And WHO is now going to give technical and financial help. Are they going to reinvent the wheel? Well, I leave it to your imagination. Therefore, when I saw this book, Traditional and Complementary Medicine, Primary Healthcare 2018 by the WHO, 
and I found a chapter which said about evidence-based approach towards integration. I led it with real interest. It had three pages on it. Unfortunately, I thought I found was that it just talked about uh, some plans being evaluated in Morocco or, or uh, they, where they have started evaluating the actual ingredients in many herbal products, etc. As far as I could see, I couldn't find no discussion of the evidence based on which this integration is done. There was, there was, a, there was no absolutely no discussion in spite of a chapter being written on it. There was no mention of evidence based medicine or how they, they would like to, inter, to bring evidence based medicine into integration integration of modern medicine with alternate with CAM. Now, this is from the article, Nice Guidelines on Complementary and Alternate Therapies. The headline itself says, says it all. It says more consistency and rigor are needed. It's a British Medical Journal of Practice in September 2009. Now, what it says is by 2009, NICE had already published 89 clinical guidelines. The majority of these documents make no mention of CAM at all. Often it seems for good reason. There are many conditions for which there is no evidence base for CAM option is concerned. Several guidelines refer to holistic care, nutrition, vitamin therapy, and exercise, which some might view as CAM. And for example, those relating to chronic or degenerative conditions explicitly recognize the need for holistic patient care and management or focus on dietary and lifestyle interventions. A small number of guidelines recognize various forms of CAM as effective treatment. Now, many of the guidelines which do incorporate CAM state or imply that the patients themselves should determine the value of CAM by trial and error or make statements such as some may, patients may find CAM useful. These are all the statements in NICE guidelines, mind you. The majority of the documents refer to CAM with the assertion that further research is needed or that evidence is insufficient for firm recommendation. In number of instances, for example, guidelines related to anxiety, type 2 diabetes, hypertension and stroke, the impression is given there is little evidence. Therefore, Though they don't say that there is no evidence in as far as CAM goes, NICE guidelines makes references to CAM, but in a very vague and evasive manner. A quick like a look at some other CAM like acupuncture. Acupuncture commonly is recommended by clinicians. Over one third of North American pediatric pain treatment programs provide acupuncture services. Now this is a pediatric uh, journal which I'm referring to. Many of the major teaching hospitals with a pediatric pain service offer acupuncture to treat chronic pain in children. The National Institute of Health Consensus Conference on Acupuncture concluded that it was effective in treating several kinds of pain and nausea in adults. It also appears to be effective for certain conditions in children. Well, it generally supposed to be safe and effective, especially for chronic pain and nausea and seems to be true both for adults and children. But solid evidence is not provided. But I think it is a practice which is well done. Regarding yoga, an increasing number of pediatric patients use yoga as a form of exercise or stress management. A review of 34 studies in pediatrics, including 19 randomized controlled trials, concluded yoga is generally safe and preliminary data suggest positive health outcomes. More and more evidence is coming down, not very robust, that yoga is effective even in pediatrics, effective to a certain extent in controlling mild to moderate hypertension. But really randomized controlled trials, I don't think there are, I couldn't find any. Now let's come to a very important topic, homeopathy, especially very interesting for pediatricians. This is from an up-to-date review article at in 2016. Now that says randomized trials of homeopathic treatment in children and adolescents have also found no convincing evidence of therapeutic benefit beyond placebo. This body of literature together with the preclinical studies cited above and the extreme 
implausibility of homeopathic tenets. That means why they say extreme implausibility is because they say dilution in light street lights and dilution increases the potency, which are, goes against the basic tenets of science, leave alone medicine. Provide compelling evidence that ultra dilute homeopathic preparations are no better than placebos. For this, there is evidence that it is not effective. I think I must back up back this statement with some solid uh, studies. Now, in a Lancet article in as early as August 2005, are clinical effects of homeopathy placebo effects comparative study of placebo controlled trials of homeopathy and allopathy. Interpretation bias are present in placebo controlled trials of both homeopathy and conventional medicine. When account was taken for these biases in the analysis, there was weak evidence for specific effect of homeopathic remedies by strong evidence for specific effects of conventional interventions. This finding is compatible with the notion that the clinical effects of homeopathy are placebo effects. They have, they have showed it by controlled trials. Therefore, there is evidence to the effect that there is no evidence for homeopathy to have any effect. It's only placebo effect. Now, for just for your information, in the passing, homeopathic remedies has been exempted from 1938 under FDA regulation. Therefore, medicines even coming from USA or Germany, they may not be under FDA regulations. Just to give a taste how controversial and divisive this can be, in a CNN news, it is reported that Prince Charles has come under fire for becoming the patron of a group that endorses homeopathic medicine. The principal, the Prince Charles, who's next in throne, has announced as a patron a faculty of homeopathic, homeopathy, it a uh, long time back. Now, see, this is, they have some people have come out telling that this is dangerously misleading advice rather than fighting the corner fight. This is a very dangerous misleading advice. That's what has come about. And, but the palace believes that safe and effective complementary medicine can play an important role in healthcare system as long as approaches are integrated with conventional treatment. Therefore, in, even in developed countries, this is what is, there is a big division. And this is, mind you, when Prince Charles is doing it, when in 2010, the UK Parliament House of Commons Science and Technology Committee presented a report that called homeopathic remedies scientifically implausible and no different from placebos. It will be interesting to look what uh, the US Department of Health and Human Services National Center for Complementary and Integrative Health had to say about our Ayurvedic medicine. Now, is Ayurvedic medicine safe? They write some Ayurvedic preparations may contain lead, mercury, arsenic in amounts that can be toxic. Now, the next question, is Ayurvedic medicine effective? They go on to say a few studies suggest that Ayurvedic preparations can reduce pain and increase function in people with osteoarthritis and help manage symptoms in type 2 diabetes but most of these trials are small and not well designed. There is little scientific evidence on Ayurveda's value for other health issues. Now, what the science says about the effectiveness of Ayurvedic medicine, few well-designed clinical trials and systemic research reviews suggest that Ayurvedic approaches are effective. Few well-designed clinical trials, they agree. More to consider, they tell the public don't use Ayurvedic medicine to postpone seeing a conventional health provider about a medical problem. If you have a health condition, talk with your conventional health care provider before using Ayurvedic medicine. Now, mind you, this is from the National Center for Complementary and Integrative Health. Not very welcoming, I suppose. To conclude in this video number four of EBM and alternate medicine, we looked at the evidence in alternate medicine. We found out that uh, as far as homeopathy is concerned, there is evidence that it, is, uh, it has nothing more than a placebo effect. Regarding the other alternate medicine, there, there is no robust evidence. 
now they are many of them like ayurveda known uh, shown to be of some effect in osteoarthritis etc we have discussed them in detail but the evidence is rather flimsy and how does alternate medicine practitioners view ebm we found out that they felt that the yardsticks used in ebm cannot be applied per se into alternate medicine basically because their medicine is individualistic holistic and even a uh, placebo effect they consider it as part of treatment but they say that they would in incorporate their own methods alternate uh, evidence by which they will they will evaluate their system of medicine and this evidence based medicine the by which the modern medicine is evaluated cannot be applied to them who also seems to agree with it as far as nice guidelines say they are they are rather not very specific regarding the evaluation of alternate medicine now all this bounds to one factor one is very clear from all this that is almost impossible to integrate these systems of medicine now we will be having one more video the final video in which i will summarize what i have put in the first four videos number 1 number 2 i would say what exactly does the doctors can do more doctors of uh, conventional medicine or modern medicine how can they alter their practice or how should they be practicing now number 3 we will also be looking at how the organization should ima etc should uh, go ahead dealing with this situation and the most important of all what how what can the patients do in choosing between modern medicine and alternate medicine thank you for listening to me so long my other videos can be found in this web address and i also blog on wordpress.com whose link i have given below thank you and goodbye till we see again